This podcast contains some real life. There's a bit of strong language. Yes, I'm swearing again. And there's also a loaf of bread coming out of the oven. Hi, I'm Kate and welcome to Life and Inside Job, the podcast where we explore how to nourish our inner worlds and make them a great place to hang out so your outer world can become more fun, meaningful and satisfying. In this episode, I have a fascinating insight into period pain with my colleague, menstruality coach, educator, speaker and facilitator, the multi-talented Lisa de Jong. Lisa works in Ireland and helps women understand and work with the cyclical nature of their menstrual cycle for physical and emotional well-being. I was so touched that Lisa decided to share her personal journey with period pain. We had a sweet and tender conversation and as well as being moved, you'll learn loads about how to manage period pain and the utter gems of wisdom that has gathered over the years. Hello Lisa, thank you so much for agreeing to talk to me for this pod chat. I am very, oh, I got the cold shivers about, about this conversation because we, we know each other quite well in many different ways. Um, but there's also stuff that we don't know about each other and we haven't really spoken about. And one of the things I'd be fascinated to hear more about was the challenges that you faced with your period, specifically in your menstrual cycle, because it's often been challenging, immensely challenging. Mm. Thanks, Kate. Thanks for having me here on your, your new podcast. It's a pleasure. Um, yeah, we've known each other maybe for two, three years now since we mm. trained with Red School. And we've been in the same peer group for that time. Mm. Um, but yeah, I am um, 33 and I have had, I, I have had, uh, I have experienced, <laughs> to think about my language with this, I've experienced period pain on and off um, since I can remember, since, since, well, I remember the first time I got period pain, actually. Um, uh, it was maybe several, a couple of years after my first period. Um, I was in secondary school and I was at home. I think it was a weekend and we had quite a big garden outside. So I would have played a lot outside in the garden. I think it was the summertime. And at that time in my life, I was reading um, these teenage girls magazines. Uh, I think they might be the same ones that you have over in the UK. So I'm here in Ireland and they were called Sugar Magazine. And oh Mills. yeah, 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 yeah. Just 17. <laughs> Did you read that? No, I didn't have that one. I had a few. Ms. M-I-Z-Z and Sugar. Uh-huh. And my mom didn't so much approve of Sugar. <laughs> uh, so I had to hide Lots that one. Tips. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um but she was she was okay with Miz and in fairness like I was pretty young I would have been you know 14 or so um and one day I was just in my innocent teenage self playing playing outside or maybe I was doing arts and crafts I don't know I was just happy out and I was on my period and um I, I got a very unfamiliar pain in my tummy that I never had before, um, a very yeah dull ache kind of a pain that didn't debilitate me, but it was enough to stop me in my tracks and you know mm. uh, do something about it. And so I went down to the, I didn't say anything to anyone. I went down to the kitchen. I thought it was hunger pains, Kate. I thought it was like a kind of a new form mm. of hunger pain. Mm. And I suppose at that age, you're still getting to know your body in different ways. You know, not just puberty, but the odd aches and pains you know that you get yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um so i i ate two bananas to rid myself of this hunger 
<laughs> and uh, it didn't go away and it stayed there. And then I remembered, oh, I'm on my period. And I remember reading the Agony Aunt pages in those magazines and they had spoken about period pain. And I remember one of the tips that they gave was get some gentle exercise mm. if you have period pain. So I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll go outside and run laps around the garden. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, wow. oh, oh, and I was, uh, I was, I was quite athletic. I was in the local athletics club. And, ah, you were you know, sporty. Was, yeah, oh. yeah. I was very sporty. Mm. I was a sporty kid. And uh, mm. so I ran I'm running around the garden and it didn't go away. And then I went inside, I think my mom was cooking or baking. And I just said to her mom, I'm, I have my period and I have a lot of pain. And she just said, oh, that's, that's okay. That's just period pain. That's very common. And she gave me two aspirins. Um, and I think she might've given me a hot water bottle. And I just sat in the chair next to her while she mm. carried on the kitchen. And uh, yeah, it was kind of this feeling of like, okay <laughs> is this it so uh I had to stop you know I wasn't used to that I was used to going mm. and playing and being active uh mm. so yeah it was a kind of a funny um almost like a little a little disappointment in myself not with mm. myself but in in myself for mm. not being able to you know run around and not be in pain I had to stop and take painkiller I didn't Mm. like that at that age so Mm. yeah so I'm I'm gonna ask you the question that as um menstrualistas people who work with cycles menstrual cycles and menopause I'm gonna ask you the question that we always ask people was why then like two years you'd had you'd had a cycle for two years Mm. I mean you know you may not want to answer that question um for the podcast but just for people who are listening our psychic events in our life have profound effects on our cycles i mean you must have seen that with your clients as well yeah absolutely yeah it's funny that I say two two years because now that I think about it it mightn't have been as long as two years it might have been one or Mm. half a year felt like two years (laughs) yeah it did um but another part of that story is I got my period when I was um 11 and a half Mm. and it was during a very difficult time in my life I was um my pet we had moved from Ireland to the Netherlands my father is Dutch Mm -hmm. and the year before I got my period we moved home against my will Mm -hmm. (laughs) and it was very traumatic and emotional I was pre-pubescent and I had friends and I was you know going into the final year of school and then I was then even though I had family in the Netherlands and I was born there I I I moved so I was born in the Netherlands and I moved to Ireland when I was four and then my whole childhood was in Ireland but then we Mm -hmm. moved back then when I was Mm -hmm. uh, 10 so um and then I got my period that year and it was there was a lot of confusion in me as a pre-pubescent girl because in Ireland it was a very conservative and like there was still yeah it was very conservative still is very conservative uh, society and my upbringing and my school there was a lot of innocence there still Mm. very much and then when I was planted (laughs) very intentionally using that word here planted in school in the Netherlands it's different language um it was a lot more liberal Mm. you know girls talked about their bodies more openly at that age Mm. um you know, they talked about boys a lot younger than my friends did in Ireland. So it was, it was a little unsettling, actually. Mm. Um, well, very unsettling. And, and then I got my period then at the end of that year. And we only spent a year there and then we moved back to Ireland. <laughs> wow. And I didn't get my second period until a year later. Right. Yeah. So, so everything stopped. Yeah. At the second move. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah it's quite quite often i notice with my my clients that um the the bleeding bit of the cycle the, the actual menstruation sometimes just stops when there is when it's not safe you know mm. when there's too much disruption for whatever reason there's just mm -hmm. this kind of <laughs> and the body goes <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah it's visual you can't see me if you can't see me it's i'm doing a sort of purse lip thing i'm, I'm not bleeding. i'm not bleeding now i'm not letting go <laughs> it's so true kate and that still that still happens to me now that i think about it i still have that I had a busy week a few weeks ago and my period came when that busy week ended, you know, and yeah. a couple of years ago I was in a job where I didn't feel sick, I had a terrible boss, and um, not to go into that story too much, but it was just not an emotionally safe environment and my period was late coming up to Christmas and the, the minute our Christmas holiday started, <laughs> I got my period. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, wise uh, bodies. Yeah, <laughs> wise bodies. And there's there's that element of oh, of re relief yeah. and release and letting go that can come with yeah. menstruation. That is just so. Yeah, it's, oh, it's, God, it's I wonderful. I've missed that so much. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but the flip side to that is we do at least I know I do a lot of inner holding. Mm -hmm. You know, right. there's a lot of holding that comes before that. Mm. that when you're in it it's hard to see it when you're in it you know impossible <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah um, yeah so that's not and that can then of course contribute to pain and other mm. things because your hormones are going up high and then you've got cortisol and adrenaline running through your system and yeah yeah, yeah so and we as we know cortisol oh no it's a sweary it was the sweary one again Oh, you know, cortisol just fucks everything up in your hormone <laughs> system, doesn't it? Yeah, it just fucks it up. Like too much of it. Yeah. Is it true that a little bit like we need cortisol, obviously, don't we, to regulate our sleep cycle and our motivation yeah. levels? Yeah. But if there's too much, that's when that happens, right? It's yeah. it just yeah. Or even if there's too little of it. Yeah. Same or thing. You then you, if there's too much over a long period of time, then you end up with none. And <laughs> okay, that's, yeah. I'm raising my hand for that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that was your first experience. And how did that develop over your late teens and early twenties? Because, you know, I'm, I mean, I, I don't really know about you, but I imagine you were kind of out there, kind of out in the world and discovering who you are and at uni or, college or whatever yeah. and first jobs and first relationships and yeah um uh I didn't enjoy my teenage years <laughs> let's just mm. put it that way I mean I had lovely times but I felt a huge amount of peer pressure mm. and I grew I, I went to a school where there was a lot of pressure it was it was, it was a wonderful school and I achieved wonderful things mm. But it was a lot to take on uh, and right. there was a lot of pressure to perform in sports and in academics and in you know being a girl and looking a certain way and all that stuff and uh yeah it was tough definitely mm -hmm. um but 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 of course it wasn't all bad i have lots of great memories and great friends from that time mm -hmm. um but yeah, I, I then, my periods didn't stop getting sore. They got worse over time. Yeah. And uh, I, I, do you know what I really struggled with? Um, I really struggled with having my period in school and just the feeling of not being comfortable, like having to wear a school uniform that I didn't mm. like, mm. Um, having to go with the school routine and only being able to go to the toilet then when the bell rang and you know having yeah. to go to sports I had sports class every day after school and having to show mm. up for that and mm. it was just a lot of uh yeah it was just a lot of again a lot of inner holding a lot of mm. not being able to let go um and and then of course I didn't like pads and it was you know shame and taboo around that mm. um so yeah my, my pain was it got so bad to the point where I would um, 
I wouldn't faint completely, but I'd kind of, you know, come to the edge of fainting, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. I'd know mm-hmm. how to stop myself from actually fainting, but it would be so bad I'd have to, my mum would have to collect me from school. Um, I took a lot of painkillers. Um, I would have to go to the, the nurse a lot. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was very unpleasant. And I had a lot of fear around my period I didn't track my cycle so I never really knew when it was coming except for that I Mm. what I did know was that I always cried the day before my period came (laughs) (laughs) so that was a good indicator Mm. Uh, and they were very heavy my periods were very heavy and since doing this work that I now do now I have learned that that's actually very normal for teenage girls to have a longer follicular phase Oh, really? I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, it's Lara Bryden writes about that in her book. Oh. Um, and she talks about how it takes several years for the kind of the hormonal rivers to settle and find themselves in our, in our bodies. Mm. And therefore, maybe not every girl, but at least I, I hear it's very common for teenage girls to have heavy, heavy periods because mm. of higher levels of estrogen. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, so just you know, having to change your pad quite often when you were wearing a uniform and you were cold as well. It was just, oh, it was shit. <laughs> God. I mean, just listening to you talking about this, I can feel all the restriction of being a teen, uh, the uh, pressure to look a particular way and into the like, the uh, constant anxiety about needing to like the right things and say the right things and how... Um, uh, ridicule would fly out from nowhere and you wouldn't be entirely sure why Um, and the the rigidity of routine and showing up and and well maybe in some places you can but in certainly when we were growing up it wasn't possible to sort of talk to a teacher and say look this is happening and how can we negotiate you know Mm. yeah you're stuck in the Yeah. And the structure of school. Oh, <laughs> yes. I'm so glad. I, I wake up every day, even if I'm feeling like shit. My God, I don't have to go to school. I, don't yeah. tell my kids. <laughs> don't tell my mum. <laughs> and I mean, I wouldn't mind. I think structure is good. And, you know, like, oh, I, love, yeah, I like, I love yes, structure. they're great teachers. And I, I really love learning. But yeah, it was just like what you said, that rigidity, that mm. holding. And there, there were one or two teachers who were very compassionate. And it's not like I was being overtly shamed, mm. but it, there just wasn't enough tenderness. You know, mm. there wasn't, yeah, there wasn't enough tenderness. There was a lot of expectation. And, uh, and I didn't have that because of that. Um, and my family, God bless them, like they would have put a lot of expectation on us too. Mm. Um, and so I didn't have the skills inside me to hold myself you know to soothe myself Um, Mm. so there was a lot of inner judgment happening Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah I'm I'm really curious how over time over that 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 sort of over your teens and 20s how did um, the pain uh, play out in terms of your identity and who you thought Mm. you were Yeah, that's a good question, Kate. Um, um, Yeah, definitely as someone who had this problem, who didn't really talk about it, um, but was trying to find a way to fix it, um, which I still still do. Um, But yeah, yeah, it, it, it definitely... It, but it wasn't something that was always on my mind. It was like, it was, I was the, in myself, like not, it wasn't known by the whole school and by my class that I was like okay. a girl with period pain. I was able to, you know, somehow keep that quite private. At least that's how I felt. Maybe some of my friends knew about it. But almost to the extreme where very few people knew how bad it really was, mm. except for my mum and, um even the rest of my family, like I didn't really let on 
you know that must have been exhausting too to to mark to do the masking (laughs) and the pretending that god yes so there's the pain and managing a pain but then there's pretending not to have or hiding it oh god yeah 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 and 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 i bet you got excellent results and were a superstar as well in school oh yeah i I think possibly you should be running the country (laughs) (laughs) you're too sensitive for that but yeah i know can i just say bloody hell (laughs) i know that's a lot yeah i know wow yeah yeah it was intense yeah and i was the second eldest in my family so and i have so i've got one older brother and two younger siblings and um yeah i would have been the mature you know one of my brother and i would have been the two older mature ones holding it together you know yeah oh the curse of the elder child <laughs> I'm the youngest, so I get, I get away with all sorts of naughty. Ah, stuff. very good. Yeah, <laughs> but I can see in my in my family and in other people's families how the eldest has a, the elder the elder children have a real a very particular role to play in terms of you know mm. you should know better. You should. Yeah. Be, you should. You should. You should. Yeah, well, that's a really good point because I do think I grew up sort of emotionally very early and Mm. yeah I was um yeah I was older before I was older you know that kind of way I was I don't really have many memories say of believing in Santa Claus Mm. um or innocent things like that I remember really looking like I learned to tie my shoelaces very young (laughs) cycle a bike very very young I could cycle my bicycle you know things like that I just remember always being very capable Mm. Uh, but feeling I should be capable yeah yeah Mm. Mm -hmm. and did you did you look for a diagnosis did you go to GPs I mean I I don't think we can have this conversation without unpacking (laughs) (laughs) unpacking Uh, GPs um reactions okay so (laughs) (laughs) how nice should I be here Uh, (laughs) uh yeah I did of course I did I I did. I had a very kind, gentle GP in Greystone. It's the town I grew up in here in, mm-hmm. in Ireland. Um, however, I wasn't heard, Kate, at all, like now that I look back. And it's not anything personal about him. It was just that medical system, you know. So mm-hmm. essentially what it was, was I went to the doctor with period pain several times with my mum. And um, I remember he gave me painkillers and that was fine, but they didn't really work. They were over the counter. I don't know, um, paracetamol or codeine, I can't remember. And, and then I went back and I I, I just remember, I have this memory of him asking me on a scale of one to 10, how bad is the pain? And I was like, why is he asking me this question? This is the third time I'm here. Obviously it's 10, you know, or nine, like, hi. Like, so I kind of just said, I said it to him in that kind of tone. I was like, oh, like it's eight, nine, 10, it's really high. And he was really shocked. Like he was surprised. It was like, he didn't really believe me, mm. you know? Um, and I remember internalizing that a little bit and mm. kind of doubting myself then, questioning mm. myself with my own pain threshold. Mm. Um, yeah and and then he he put me on the pill um which was good except for when he put me on the pill I was probably at this point I was 16 and I remember him saying to me um if you ever something I can't remember exactly what he said but he said something like if you ever have an accident or something you know you can come to me and I was like what is he talking about and then it was only after that I realized, I wonder, is, does he think that I'm making up my pain to get the pill for contraception? Uh, so there was a whole other layer on top oh, of that. Bloody hell. So, oh. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I would have been, oh. I wasn't having sex at that age. And, you know, I mm. was very much still exploring my sexual, well, like getting to know who I was. It's still very innocent. And... Wow. It took, yeah, it took me a while to read into that. And I felt, mm. uh, I actually felt quite embarrassed actually, Kate, you know, when, mm. when, when I realized that, um, 
and a little bit disappointed. Uh, and anyway, so I was on the pill and um, I ended up being on about four or five different types of pills because they all had different side effects, uh, whether it be bleeding, breaking through, bleeding through, um, or mood swings, or mm. I got really, really dry skin on one pill, like mm. where my skin was flaking off my face. It was horrific. Mm. And then, and then I had really bad acne and like really bad cystic acne. So then I just, uh, then when I was in university at the age of 20, 20, I decided to come off the pill mm -hmm. and I was just like, no, no more pill. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, and then I, my pain came back because the pain stopped when I was on the pill, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I, I, I didn't want to be having, I thought, you know, something, I don't want to have acne all over my face. <clears throat> um, I'd rather sort out my pain. I'd rather sort my pain out and not have like there, this. I just knew there was, this wasn't okay to be breaking out in acne or the other option was to be having chronic period pain. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> um, so I came off the pill, then the pain came back. Then I went back to the doctor and a different doctor in my twenties. And uh, I said, look, I, I'm still having period pain. And then she prescribed me the mini pill. And she also said, um, it could be endometriosis, but let's not go down that road because the way that you would get diagnosed would be through surgery. And that's quite drastic. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, never really heard of endometriosis before. I remember learning about it in mm -hmm. school, but I just didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't think it was an issue. And um, uh, so I went, she gave me a prescription for the mini pill, which I think is just um, progesterone only. Mm -hmm. And I came home, felt again, very disheartened. And I shoved the prescription in my bedside locker. I took out my laptop. <laughs> At this point, Google existed. So I started Googling <laughs> things. <laughs> I started like manically Googling every possible keyword that I could think oh. of in relation to bodies and periods and hormones. Okay. And I came across Elisa VT. Ah, oh, thank goodness for that. Yeah. I thought when he said he started Googling, I thought we were going <laughs> to... It's no, a stream of fear and panic. No, no, no. This was, no. You Googled I had to, well. Yeah, I Googled stuff before and Google had always thrown me things like lavender and chamomile tea and you know, the usual <laughs> stuff, like, which is helpful, but, you Oops. know, not, yeah, yeah, it doesn't prevent it. And... Mm. Uh, so I found Elisa Vitti and mm. uh, this was like when the, the year she published her book. So it was oh, a, wow. a talk she did in Google. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Mm. And, and that's how I started my journey. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll put the uh, link to the book in the, in the notes underneath the mm. uh, podcast because it is amazing. It's, mm -hmm. it's a game changer. Yeah, game changer. And then on the back of that, I found Red School. Um, I found my massage therapy, uh, Yoni steaming, diet. I want to slow down, slow down, slow down. <laughs> <laughs> so, what did you take from Anissa Vitti's book that was, well, if you can, can you recall how it, how it struck, how it struck your eyes, how it, how it landed? Yeah. Uh, I was putting a lot of chemicals in my body. That was okay. one thing. I was needing to look a certain way as a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would have worn not a lot of makeup, but I wore makeup and uh, perfume and nail varnish and mm -hmm. this cream and that cream and this type of deodorant. So I, you know, so I wouldn't sweat too much and, mm -hmm. um, you know, this type of toothpaste or whatever, all the creams and lotions and lotions mm -hmm. a lot of us put on our body. Um, that's not to say it's bad actually, because I, I really like cosmetics and all that stuff, but it's just, I had to learn to buy things that are less harmful to my hormones because mm -hmm. those, some of those, not all, some of those products have, um, chemicals that are called endocrine disruptors mm -hmm. and they can knock, knock your hormones off a bit. Um, so I learned about that. Yeah. I learned about, um, the systemic nature of the of our hormones so mm -hmm. and of the endocrine system so it's not just about 
my womb it's about my liver my digestive system my gut my you know if i'm stressed about something that could contribute then to mm. hormonal imbalance um and really looking at myself very holistically in that way it's mm. like that systemic kind of approach to well-being and that yeah that helped me because i was still getting hormonal acne after the pill i'd been off the pill but it was still my skin was breaking out a lot and um yeah it was just a game changer in in my lifestyle and mm. helping helping me really cleanse like cleanse my system mm. and heal how, my how long do you think and I, I don't know if you maybe you don't know but how long do you think it takes for the pill the chemicals from the pill to leave the body and uh like i say a natural a natural cycle to reassert itself well i've heard of women who you know um don't take the pill for a week and then they get pregnant mm. uh, i've heard of women who whose cycle doesn't come back for a couple of years mm. and for me my cycle came back quickly but it's not something i was so i was observing so much because i wasn't trying to get pregnant mm. but um, in terms of my i just remember having like skin problems and it took like, two years for my skin to really clear up um yeah and I think it was to do with my liver because the, because the way our you know this already but for for listeners uh, the way our system works is we've got three excretory organs in our body our liver our gut and our skin mm. and if we're and they're all they all do really good jobs of like removing things from our body removing toxins but if we're getting stuff coming out of our skin it's a little indicator that our liver is under pressure or our gut is under pressure mm. so I had to really eat and eat for my liver, eat for my gut. Mm. And that took a couple of years. I got a, I, I also had a great um, beauticianist who did really good facials and she was able to mm. like help my skin clear as well. Right. Yeah. So I had to be patient with it. Mm. Yeah. And also I was in therapy at the time. So I was doing a lot of emotional clearing too. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, it took, for me, it took, it took some time, but it was worth it. Mm. Yeah. And then you came across Red School. Yeah. <laughs> then I came across Red School. Um, maybe, can you, maybe you could say a bit about what Red School is <laughs> for people who don't know. Red School is an organisation based in the UK, run by, um, founded by, a psychotherapist called Alexandra Pope and she, she, so she has a co-founder now Shani Huber Wurlitzer and they together create courses and workshops um, to help women connect with the cyclical nature of their menstrual cycle and heal their menstrual stories um, in their bodies and start to understand the energetics of their menstrual cycle and reclaim their um Ooh, that's exciting What's yeah that sorry my, <laughs> my alarm just went off to take bread out of the oven so i'll uh, oh, i'll just bread, I'll bread. yeah do, 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 do. it's a podcast <laughs> thing you know we go do, 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 do. Break, break. i'm gonna pause the recording now. Okay. perfect i'll be back in one moment okay <laughs> What, what kind of bread is it? Um, it's a high fiber bread. Mm. Um, it's called life changing bread. You can Google that and you can find the recipe. Um, it's got, it's made with all dairy free, gluten free, and but it's made with psyllium husks mm. and linseed. So you've got a lot of omega threes and that's fiber. how you say it. I've never been able to. Say, I've never known how to say it. Psyllium. Psyllium. You it ignore with the P. Yeah, it's a silent P. <laughs> I learn something new every day. Like, like psychology. Yeah, like psychology. <laughs> oh, you see, now when somebody asks me, I can say, "Well, you don't say the P like psychology." <laughs> anyway. Uh, should we jump to the, the bread thing or should we go back to Well, uh, it links it links to okay. oh, it links to what I was saying actually prior to Red School. It does, yeah. I the think I think the bread the bread take, takes the day, really. It does, yeah. Um mm -hmm. 
it was actually one of our peers, Abby, who yeah. gave me the recipe. Mm. Fiber, high fiber foods really help to um, balance hormones. So essentially what's happening is every month our menstrual cycle makes estrogen and progesterone. And uh, if we have an, in our liver, one of the roles of the liver is to remove the estrogen that we no longer need to help us then actually have a period. Mm. But if our liver isn't working as much as it can do, or if our gut is constipated, then we reabsorb estrogen into our system. Mm. And then we get things like PMS, period pain, heavy bleeding, uh, acne. And so fiber foods, lots of fresh fruit and vegetables and things that have high, that are high in fiber just help to flush, mm. clean the pipes. Clean the pipes. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. So but if you're, if you are going to be eating higher, higher fiber meals, make sure you drink plenty of water as well. Mm. And get belly massage. Oh former, yes. As a former belly massage person. Yeah. Get, get, yeah. A, get a little um, gentle love on, on the colon always helps too. Okay. I've never had that before. I've had Maya massage therapy. Is that the same thing? Kate? Yeah. They, they, they'll work on the, on the okay. colon too. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Wonderful. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, Red School. Um, mm. So yeah, Alexander and Shani um, our teachers our trainers um and i yeah i so that's what they do they they have courses and workshops and they train people like you and me they train trainers to teach their work mm -hmm. um and it's really all really it is it's all about coming in back into relationship with your menstrual cycle as as not a weakness you know mm -hmm. but something to work with and harness and potentially it might be a good thing in your life potentially <laughs> yeah <laughs> and what did you notice when you started charting in uh, chart sorry I should I should be more specific what did you notice when you started charting your emotions and feelings alongside your cycle yeah th well th there was definitely uh because that goes back several years that's why I'm thinking about mm. it um there was definitely a cyclical nature to my feelings and um, particularly in the premenstrual time mm. and that I had a lot of difficulty letting go of stuff, people usually. <laughs> and um, yeah, that for me, it was more the physical. I think I was more getting in touch with the physical side. So mm. learning to manage my energy levels better around my cycle. Mm. Um, and then, and also my mental state. So, you know, what was going on for me cognitively and even spiritually. Mm. Um, and I would definitely feel like, so over time, what I've learned over, you know, after tracking for several years is that, um, I, 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 my inner autumn, so that phase before menstruation, the premenstrual phase, used to be very difficult for me. It used to be, I used to be very PMSy and cranky and snappy and moody and all that. And uh, I learned that actually, and I was kind of, I, you know, my mom used to say to me, like, she used to kind of label me as moody a lot. Um, and I would blame myself for being moody. So I'd mm. be moody, but then I'd be, having this negative oh, interesting a moody girl yeah and it's a thing isn't it it's a real judgment about about young women yeah and about women she's yeah. moody yeah sure she was moody too mom yeah you say like i'm not moody i'm not angry <laughs> i am not angry yeah um yeah. that shows up more with my kids now i am not cross i say <laughs> I, could, I could snap nuts with my jaw like, are you, yeah. You are. <laughs> yeah you are yeah so i was i was i was the, i was labeled as like i mean i wasn't only labeled as moody but i was, I was labeled as moody and also that i complained a lot um wow but yeah but and um, 
that and that I was overly sensitive. But actually, what I've learned oh. is, I know. Thankfully, I had a great therapist who oh, was able to uh, help me see the power of that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I learned actually that my that I am very highly sensitive um, and very intuitive mm. and that I just need to look after my sensory self um, at different times of the cycle. That's really important. Mm. Um, so tell I me need... how you do that, because sensitivity is a thing, right? Mm -hmm. And I would bet that probably most of the people who are listening to this and are interested in this kind of topic are going to have sensitivity of some kind. And like your experience I think very often we're made to feel wrong and judged because we feel too much whether it's emotionally or physically or mentally it gets judged as being you know you're too sensitive and there's a judgment in there but actually mm -hmm. there are gifts many many gifts in there when we can take care of that sensitivity and I'm really interested how you did that with your cycle when you were also suffering from pain yeah that's a really good question i um yeah i was only getting to know my sensitivity separately to my cycle when i was in therapy because i wasn't talking to my therapist about cycle awareness i was talking to her about pain if this is my early early 20s mm. um and and then i was also doing red schools work tracking the cycle and i had a listening partner mm -hmm. And I, I shared, I started to share more. I started to talk more about it and they gave me permission to be really curious about my sensitivity. So like some of the stuff I used to say to my therapist, I felt was absolutely bonkers, you know, like, why am I feeling like I'm carrying something in my energy field? <laughs> um, and she was like well maybe you are so let's talk about that you know instead mm. of poo-pooing it mm. so she created a huge amount of space for curiosity and intrigue and safety around my sensitivity mm. and I started to grow that within myself um and so practically speaking what I did was I started to journal a lot more and mm -hmm. um, I started to notice my dreams a lot more um I started to process my emotions a lot more. I used to, I, I had to really give myself permission to feel mm. and, to, and to feel safe to feel. Mm. Um, That's massive, isn't it? Huge, huge. Mm. Um, and, to, and because I suppose in my upbringing, it would have been, it would have been, you know, of course it would have been okay to feel, but it was always kind of pathologized and had to be fixed and there was something wrong with you if you were upset. Whereas now I'm able to, be in my regulated self mm. but also feel sad um mm. and with my menstrual cycle as i tracked my cycle i realized certain i i realized that there was like my cycle what was happening in my body is a container it's like a physical container through which you experience yourself and oh can you say that again please god yeah so my cycle it's a physical container through which i experience myself and so Beautiful. yeah and what i mean by that is is that every month as i tracked i got to realize that my hormones are doing this thing they're changing every month mm. and therefore the the thickness or the thinness of this container that i am in is ebbing and flowing every month so um very simply put if i have sadness and i'm in my ovulation mm -hmm. i have much more resilience around that mm -hmm. i i'm I, like it's sort of there but it's not it's not hijacking me um and i have a lot of resources you know i, I just feel okay with mm -hmm. loss or fear or anxiety in my inner summer mm -hmm. obviously provided that i've kind of rested and mm -hmm. you know um I'm not burning out because that's, that's a different thing. Mm. Um, but then as I move from my ovulation around into autumn, my vessel gets thinner. So the veil between myself and the external world is thinner. Mm. And therefore, because I'm a human that experiences emotions 
that resilience um, gets thinner. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Mm. It's, this is all just very neutral. It's just a thing. So, um, so I feel my feelings um, are just heavier or, or they're, they're, yeah, they're stronger, you know, coming mm. up to, coming up to my period. Um, and that's kind of, yeah, I don't know. I hope that explains it, but that's, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. And I, what I really like about the way that you, it's like a picture. I can kind of see the picture. I see the visuals with it is that, um, it's, it's neutral. Mm -hmm. You know, you can see that this is what's happening and then you can layer any meaning on that. Exactly. Exactly. That's the thing is, mm. I think that's ultimately where the, the skill is, is um, bringing presence to something that's happening anyway. Mm. And um, <clears throat> just being objective and not, yeah, just removing ourselves a little bit from judgment <laughs> and expectation, yeah. because th this goes back to what you were saying earlier about people not knowing what to do with their sensitivity and it being, a, a, you know, seen as a bad thing. Mm. And we can experience it as a bad thing when we're in an environment where we can't support it or it's, you know, it's, 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 um, it's, yeah, we're being harmed or there's a lot of pressure. And, um, and so, yeah, I didn't grow up in a world <laughs> where sensitivity was encouraged or seen mm. as a good thing. So I had to really build that within myself. Mm. Um, so now um, I have to do, it depends on where I am in my menstrual cycle, but say if I'm, if I have a very busy day or if I'm going to be around a lot of people um, just before my period or even after my period, my more vulnerable times are coming out of menstruation mm -hmm. and then men menstruation That's itself. so common, <laughs> isn't it? That post-menstruation slap down <laughs> yeah because that vessel is still it's still thin right still thin yeah yeah very, and we don't very even, fragile and we don't even have menstruation to anchor in there mm -hmm. that's that's that my experience is it's like mm. i don't even have an anchor because mm. in a way and coming back to pain pain and for a lot of women i've heard from some clients a little bit of pain can help you anchor in your cyst in your body it can ground you and um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so and I, I know that would be my experience too. Whereas if you're coming out of menstruation, you're low in hormones, low in energy, and then there's this kind of vacant thing. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, so going back, yeah. So so when it comes to, it's just really like managing your managing yourself, man. You know, boundary having boundaries, mm -hmm. um, looking after yourself during the day, self care. Um, being careful with judgments because my my judgments around myself can be quite insidious i don't see them you know so i have yeah. to watch them that's sneaky buggers aren't they so sneaky. That's so yeah. sneaky that's why yeah but we need friends and therapists and helpful people to say mm, hang on a minute totally that's not true yeah so i realized that time i'm enjoying i'm so enjoying this conversation it's just so interesting to be able to talk in this way and you know I have so much more appreciation of what what a hard nut you are a hard soft nut <laughs> <laughs> I mean to hold all that stuff yeah it's I'm just sure. yeah I I'm yeah. wow you're amazing <laughs> oh thanks Kate yeah thank you so how how does it work now in your cycle how do you sort of coming into your contemporary life, what helps you to manage pain? Definitely my diet. Um, mm. What I learned was that because I have a sensitive nervous system, I, I think I just have, I'm just sensitive to stuff in general. So I'm just going to take that, like take sensitivity as a kind of a general thing. So <laughs> food is important. Um, I... So, okay, period, what was happening to me was there's this, there's a hormone called prostaglandins mm. that cause the uterus to contract. Um, again, for your listeners, they, 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 they cause the uterus to contract and they're released with the onset of menstruation or just like a few days before menstruation. 
a lot of women will have too many prostaglandins mm -hmm. because of hormonal imbalances. And so, and, and the reason I know that my, my prostaglandins were so high was because I would get that fainting feeling very quickly, you mm -hmm. know, and pain would, I'd get lightheaded and fainty and then pain would come. Okay. And I'd also get the runs, I'd get diarrhea. So, and that's mm -hmm. a sign of high prostaglandins. So mm -hmm. they were nice clues to help me understand, okay, I, I just need to bring down my prostaglandin level. So uh, there's different things you can do via your diet to, mm -hmm. to bring down your prostaglandin. So higher fiber foods, um, you know, anti-inflammatory foods. So keeping your sugar, sugar, like processed sugar low, caffeine mm -hmm. low, sleep, um, things like that. Not too much alcohol. And, and even if you do this in the week before your period, so that's, you know, I'd eat a lot of plant-based foods the week before. Mm -hmm. Um, so that really helps me also, I, I don't have a problem with taking painkillers. So, um, I used to take a lot of very strong ones, but now I, I don't have to take those. I can just take ibuprofen. Mm -hmm. And if I take them with the onset of menstruation, that then prevents me from needing to take loads of painkillers. Um, so, because it, it helps yeah. bring the prostaglandin levels down. Yeah. yeah. That doesn't, it doesn't. It? Does ibuprofen reduce reduce flow as well? Yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't have a problem with flow, but it okay. does for for women who have heavy periods. Ibuprofen can reduce the flow. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I sometimes do castor oil packs as well, Kate. Um, which is a bit of a like a decongestant thing. You can Google that. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes I do them on my liver or my womb. Um, resting before menstruation, which I find hard. Cause I can be in my fight flight mode a lot. <laughs> mm. um, and then I have fear around pain. So managing fear around pain. Yeah. Reaching out to people, talking, sharing. That's a huge part of my, my process. Um, um, lots of like, yeah. So Ooh, many can I, can I just slow that bit down and go back to that? Because I think that that's huge, but you know, it, I kind of link it to what you were saying earlier about, um, not sharing what was happening in your family when you were younger but now being able to say this is happening and I know you know you, you've spoken about calling up friends and and stuff yeah. when you need to and that I don't think we should underestimate the power of of that reaching out yeah. particularly when we we find it hard to release and let go and, and be vulnerable yeah yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, um, I'm very interested in um, addiction as well and addiction recovery, mm -hmm. and that whole idea of recovery as a path, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to whether it be pain or addiction, uh, something you have to pathologize and fix. You know, rather mm -hmm. you're in recovery. And what I like about a lot of the recovery um, models is the reaching out there, there's a lot of support in those programs and there's mm. a lot of um peer support and mentoring and mm. reaching out and um mm. it's 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 medicine actually on a very cellular level because you're what that does is it helps to um bring the nervous system into a place of rest and digest mm. when we feel safe with the people who we're sharing with yeah so mm. um so for me personally, yeah, that was like changing neural pathways in my brain of like mm. not doing all this holding myself and actually giving myself permission to be held. That, <sighs> that yeah. <laughs> my shoulders just dropped about three inches. <laughs> oh. Yeah. And I have to remind myself that, like that, that mm -hmm. one, one of my mentors, he says to me, Lisa, what comes naturally sometimes isn't always what's healthy. <laughs> <laughs> no shit <laughs> so I have to like yeah I have to you know sometimes I just mm. reach like send even just a text message to say to someone look I'm not feeling great I just mm. want you to know um, mm. it helps with fear it helps with anxiety it helps to just not be alone no matter what's going on yeah mm. oh mm. yeah I, my heart really responds to that yeah. Mm. And yeah. No small thing. 
No. Mm. No. And did you, I'm curious, did you ever get a diagnosis? Uh, I did actually, Kate. Yeah, I did decide even after I did a lot of the red school work, mm -hmm. I decided to go for the laparoscopy, mm -hmm. um, which is the surgery that you get to diagnose endometriosis. Mm -hmm. And I did it here in Ireland in Dublin. Um, and they did diagnose me with endometriosis, but she said it was very like tiny. There was only, you know, very few nodules they're called mm -hmm. of the endometriosis sort of in my uh, body. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I don't really relate, I don't really identify with that diagnosis um, mm -hmm. because in my gut, I don't feel that that was what was causing the problem. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, the problem is hormonal, just hormonal imbalance, which is actually a contributing factor to endometriosis. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, hormonal imbalance and the prostaglandins because I, I have had a lot of periods that were pain-free when I really, you know, when I did Elisa, Elisa Vitti, that book we mentioned at the start, I did her mm. detox diet. She's got a detox. She has a, it's not a detox. It is a detox diet, but it's not like a fasting one. Mm. It's you, you eat lots of food, but it's like a hormone, balance, hormone balancing diet. And I did it for a whole month, even though it's like five days, mm. <laughs> I was pretty desperate. And the, that month I did it, I had no pain. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I've had, I've had, I have had positive, I respond well to things like mm. that and taking certain foods, like for me, eggs, gluten, dairy, taking those out of my diet have helped okay. a lot as well. Yeah, mm. but, but in terms of the diagnosis, yeah, I did get that, but I give myself permission to not fully identify with it, which I wouldn't recommend. Um, but at the same time, it's really important to decide for yourself which path to go down in terms of recovery absolutely and not let that define who you are 100 percent, yeah because that you know taking on a diagnosis in that way can again put you know it, it not necessarily but it can put you into a very restrictive yeah space it, about how you regard yourself and how you treat yourself and how you choose to heal as well, well yeah totally and you know the some of the options I got from the gynecologist were just not good enough for me you know she she said if it comes back you know we can do surgery again like okay I'm not going to go into the whole story of my surgery but let's just say it wasn't fun <laughs> uh, it took me a long time and being sensitive it took me a very long time to recover from surgery mm. particularly my sleep mm. um and and then, she, she, yes, they said that, I can't remember the name of the drug, but it would be, you know, you could get more surgeries or you can take a drug to induce an early menopause. And at this time I was 27. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh thank no thanks. <laughs> hmm. yeah. oh, lovely. Yes. Okay. On that blinding note, <laughs> Please, can I ask you for your tippiest top tip for a lovely inside world, whether that relates to pain or your inside world? I know it's like, it's a humdinger and you can only have one because I'm a mean, I'm a big mean pants here. Bring the, for me, it would be bring curiosity to yourself. <sighs> yeah. I'm doing double thumbs up for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's mm. been a game changer in my life if, if something awful happens to me or if I'm feeling a terrible feeling or thought towards someone <laughs> it's a good place to go curiosity isn't that mm. interesting that I'm having that feeling about that thing mm. I wonder what yes that's about. <laughs> yes yes absolutely because it's like you're employing uh an inner therapist mm -hmm. yeah you're not it's like you're removed yeah mm. yeah good you one. give yourself lots of space and I'm going to get a post-it note and I'm going to write that on the top of my computer. That's interesting. I wonder why. I... Yeah. <laughs> it can be hard to go to sometimes, but when you're, yeah, like, I mean, if you're someone who's struggling with pain, it, yeah, curiosity, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of advice out there. Yeah. Um, so follow, following your, Elizabeth Gilbert talks about that. She talks about following your, your own curiosity. 
um, towards getting answers. And I think that's a nice thing to do. Mm. It brings you on a bit of what, what Red School called the breadcrumb trail. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Lisa, thank you so much for talking to me. I have learned so much and I'm sure that people listening will have learned a shed load um, about all kinds of menstrual related stuff. Mm. It's been an absolute gift. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Kate. It's been a pleasure. Big hugs. Yeah. Thanks to you. You can find out more about Lisa's programmes and one-to-ones and online stuff at yourcyclematters.com. And I'd love to hear your response to the issues we discussed. You can message me on Insta at Kate underscore Codrington and I'd love to hear what you think. I'd also love to hear what your tippy top tips are that make your inside life a wonderful place to be. If you've enjoyed an inside job, please subscribe and share it with your friends. There'll be more juicy chats and top tips for a tip top inside life coming very soon.